All right, welcome to Wednesday night prayer meeting. We'll be getting started in just a moment. We'll give it another minute here. All right, we'll just give it one minute here for Wednesday night prayer meeting. All right. Well, it is Wednesday night. If you could hear me, give me a thumbs up and we'll go ahead and get started. Hey there, Vincent. All right. Let's go ahead and jump right into this. Um, welcome to Wednesday night prayer meeting. This is episode number 107. And I'm thankful that you're here with me uh, this evening. My name is Pastor Don Mast, and with Altoona First Southern Baptist Church, we're located at 903 North 4th Street in the Juniata section of the city. And I welcome you to come visit our church. Uh, you can experience the, the warmth of, uh, of faith and the love and the strength of Jesus when you visit our church this Sunday at 1045 a.m. And if you're new to Wednesday night prayer meeting, it's actually very simple. I, I share a short lesson from the Word of God, and then we pray together. And, you know, I'm here to challenge you. I'm here to uh, get you to dive deeper into the Word of God. And, you know, just to lift our hearts together, you know, in prayer and our minds uh, to be focused more in the Lord and to seek His wisdom and guidance in our lives. And so, you know, I hope this time together will bring you uh, lasting peace and comfort and strength uh, as uh, as we begin our prayer meeting tonight. And, and just one quick announcement, we do have uh, women's Bible study coming up here on September 21st. That's uh, Saturday, September 21st at 3 p.m. at the church, and food will be provided. Uh, if you want to provide a snack or something like that, something to share with everybody, that would be super. So, um I know the ladies are looking forward to that. So, all right. The topic for tonight. The topic for tonight. Well, today, our world seems to be filled with more anger. I think that's the right word. More anger than ever before. According to recent studies, incidents of rude behavior and disrespect have increased by over, by over 30%. That's 30% plus in less than a decade. Whether it's in a restaurant where 62% of service workers report being mistreated by customers, and I'm sure you've seen it. 62% of service workers report being mistreated by customers. Or, you know, it could be our own family. You know, where it says in the, in the survey I was reading that one in three people experience extreme bitterness and ongoing resentment and fighting and all of this negative stuff in their family. You know, like so when people, you know, call and talk down to you, talk with you, disrespect, you know, these rates of 
these rates of violence and bullying and, and, and public insults have been skyrocketing, unfortunately, in our world. I mean, I just saw something. It's just the first week of school for many. And we've already seen an increase in bullying by more than 20% over the last year. In every reaction, I must say, we face a choice. Do we want to lift people up or do we want to hold people down? So tonight, I'm reminded, I'm reminded of two verses tonight. The first one is in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, where it says, and, it, and this is more focusing on talking, okay? Do not let any unwholesome talk come out according to their needs. Let me back up. Let me back up. I want to make sure this is right. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that they may benefit those who listen. That's Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. And then the second one is, is Philippians chapter 2. I love Philippians, but Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself, not looking to our own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. So, we're going to talk tonight about being a doormat. We're going to talk tonight about being a doormat as a Christian. And, and so I'd like to begin with this quote that I found from Joseph Roy. It was in a leadership book. That I was reading, and it and it talked to it's Christian leadership. A true Christian is a sign of contradiction, a living symbol of the cross. He or she is a person who believes the unbelievable, bears the unbearable, forgives the unforgivable, forgivable, <laughs> loves the unlovable. Lo what is my problem tonight? Loves the unlovable, is perfectly happy not to be perfect is willing to give up his or her own will, become weak to be strong, and finds love to be given it away. So I'm going to read that one more time. A true Christian is a sign of contradiction, a living symbol of the cross. He or she is a person who believes the unbelievable, bears the unbearable, forgives the unforgivable, loves the unlovable, is perfectly happy with not being perfect, is willing to give up his or her own will. A Christian is one who becomes weak to be strong and finds love to be given away. So, are we supposed to be okay when someone treats us like garbage? When someone treats us with disrespect? You know, you hear the question all the time, aren't Christians supposed to be meek? Aren't Christians supposed to be meek? Yes, they are to be meek, but not weak. Meek is, the meaning of it is, we are under control of ourselves. We are under control for ourselves. You know, it, in these situations, instead of either getting very, very weak and, and, and going away or, or becoming argumentative, we are staying calm. We are in control of ourselves, right? So does loving people, does loving people who mistreat us in a mean way, you know, how do I want to say this? Does loving people who mistreat us mean that we let them walk on us like a doormat? Does Jesus really expect you and I to be a doormat? Does being nice and loving and, you know, that turn the other cheek mean that we simply absorb the abuse? Are we supposed to develop some kind of weird... Stockholm Syndrome, where we fall in love with our abuser. No. 
Jesus has this revolutionary command for us to love the unlovable people in our lives. The question then comes, how do you find the balance between loving unlovable people and letting them walk all over us? This is one of the places where, you know, really following Jesus is going to get a little more complicated. It's going to get a little more messy. It's not going to be comfortable either. But again, we never said it was easy. But before I go any further, let me make this abundantly clear. If you are in any sort of a dangerous situation, get out, get help. Don't stick around. Get out of that situation and take the vulnerable people in your life with you, if that makes sense. So part of the deal of, of being in a personal relationship is Jesus with Jesus as a disciple as a disciple of Jesus is following his example. I mean Jesus dealt with people treating him badly on pretty much a regular basis. Yes, he had a lot of followers, but he also had a lot of enemies too, a lot of haters. They publicly accused him of things like lying, of being drunk, of being a glutton, and they even said he was demon possessed. People falsely charged against him, drug him off to an illegal trial, convicted him without any real evidence, and sentenced him to death without cause. You know, they saw to it that he was beaten, that he was mocked, that he was insulted, that he was tortured. He was executed by the most horrific method of the day, crucifixion. And so it's pretty fair to say he knew what it was like for people to mistreat him without cause. So how do we respond to abusive, hurtful, unlovable people? The thing is, he did not always respond the same way to to each situation. Sometimes he would call them out like he did in John verse 8, chapter 13, or John chapter 8, verse 13. Sometimes he prayed with them. That's Luke chapter 23, verse 33. Sometimes he kept his mouth shut and didn't defend himself in any way. That would be Mark 15, verse 1 through 5. His response depended on the situation. Sometimes he would speak up, and sometimes he just kind of took it on the chin. He did not have a, a set go-to reaction for every single one of these. He did not have a one-size-fits-all response to people who mistreat us or use us or who make us doormats. Even though Jesus' response to mistreatment was in many different ways, he always had the same goal in mind. He always had their salvation, their redemption in mind of the offender who was mistreating him. He always had this overriding concern where he was seeing the person saved, changed, and transformed. Sometimes that would mean things like calling them out on their abuse. Sometimes it meant patiently absorbing whatever the insults were. Whatever it took to really impact that person. He was willing to endure bad treatment in pursuit of a greater goal. And so these people had no right to verbally attack him. They had no right to beat him and to torture him. They certainly had no right to crucify him. And he could have stopped it in a moment. He said he could have instantly summoned, I think it was over 72,000 angels, or the Bible says 12 legions of angels, to fight for him. 
on earth. That's in Matthew chapter 26, verse 50. Unlike us, he did not have to take any of it. He could have just simply called the angels down and been done with it. He could have obliterated the people who hurt him in the blink of an eye. But he didn't because he had a bigger goal, a bigger purpose in mind. Jesus was willing to endure harsh treatment. If that is what it took to, to spiritually impact the person in front of him. There's a big difference between being a doormat and following the example of your Jesus, of your Lord, of your Father. A doormat assumes a powerless position. Jesus did not. For a doormat, the only goal is survival, appeasing the abuser. For Jesus, the goal was to lead the person to confront their own spiritual darkness, to confront their own sin, and to repent of it, in practical terms, in real life terms, right? In practical terms, right here. Loving people who mistreat you is not about letting them walk all over you. It's not about showing them that you're weak. It's about seeking that person's salvation, restoration, recovery, more passionately than you would seek your own rights. Most people would say that we have a right, especially in this world, in this culture, a right to retaliate in some way if someone disrespects you. If someone talks down to you, you know, makes, makes a fool of you, right? I mean, that's a natural reaction in this society as a human, right? I mean, it's a human thing. It's a worldly response. When most people get hurt, they want to hurt someone back. And you see it in countless videos now. The violence in our country is just so rampant. The violence in Europe is just so rampant. Retaliation of some kind is considered a right to many. Non-retaliation is shocking and unnatural. When you refuse to retaliate, listen to this. When you refuse to retaliate, you can create the opportunity for a more powerful impact, for a more powerful message. By patient endurance, patient endurance, you may be able to win someone over. Remember, I said this isn't going to be comfortable. This isn't going to be easy. There's also a time to speak up. This is especially true if the person who is hurting you claims to be a Christian. You know, and people say that they're Christians for all different reasons, right? You know, it could be monetarily reasons, you know? I'm a Christian and I'm going to pray and I'm, you know, I expect the Lord to give me things and be my ATM machine or, or whatever. A lot of people claim to be Christians. They go to church on Sunday. They treat people a certain way on Sunday, then Monday they're totally different. Jesus said in Luke chapter 17, verse 3, If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. I think that's pretty clear. So, here is something serious to consider. Are you really loving someone by continually, continually empowering them to do something that is sinful? Are you really loving someone by continually empowering them to do something that is sinful? It is a sin to mistreat someone. God will hold that person. God will hold that person accountable. If you are enabling their sin by taking their abuse passively, you might be making things worse for them. There's a time to speak up, not for your own sake, but for theirs. 
And also, there's a zero tolerance policy for bullies. At least there should be, right? There's a time when you must stand up for yourself, not really, not really for your own benefit. You should not enable sinful behavior in, other, in another person. To be honest, this is, this is something very difficult to do the right way. It's very difficult not to be motivated by your own desire to be treated properly, respectfully. After all, everyone should be treated you know, the way they want to be treated, with respect, with kindness, with love, with appreciation. But the motivation for confronting the person should not be just so you will be treated right. It should be because that person is digging themselves in a deeper hole, right? It, 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 that's what's happening. And so unless they change their ways... They will pay the ultimate price for this. And it's our responsibility to call them out and to rebuke them, to have them repent. When you speak up, let love for that person be the key motivator. They need to face their own spiritual darkness and seek Jesus. Jesus doesn't call you, doesn't call me to be a doormat. But he does call us to seek salvation and the rescue of people, even at the cost of ourselves, if we're true Christians, right? Instead of having revenge or even justice as your goal, make the redemption, make the salvation, make the saving of their soul, of that person, your goal. Because, you know, they could say they go to church, they could say they do all this stuff, they could say they're praying, but you know what? Your fruits, your fruits of the Spirit will be a quick little indicator that you have not changed. And we're going to talk about that on Sunday. But redemption Salvation, those are what you need to focus on with your enemies, with those who are being disrespectful for you. You've got to love those who are unlovable. That is what Jesus did. So in the times when Jesus confronted those who mistreated him, his ultimate goal was their restoration, their salvation. In the times when Jesus quietly endured the mistreatment, his ultimate goal was their redemption. You see the pattern here, right? The question was not, what's best for me? What's in it for me? What can I get out of this? The question is, what will make the most impact on them? What will cause them to change? What will cause you to change? Yes. Love people who hate you, who disrespect you. Be kind to people who abuse you. Go out of your way to help people who take you for granted. I know that's hard. Forgive them and never, never hold a grudge. Never hold a grudge. But don't do these things just to keep the peace. Don't do it just because you're a doormat. Don't do it because you're a doormat. Love the unlovable out of the desire to touch their heart for Jesus. That's what you've got to do. Love the unlovable because you can break down impossible barriers. Love the unlovable to show them the love of Jesus. To show them that they are loved. They may be bitter, they may be full of hate, but you know what? They were created for a purpose by our Lord. Love the unlovable, the unlovable because that is what Jesus said for us to do. That's how you're a revolutionary Christian. I mean, this is a messy business. If you live like this, some people will never understand it. 
You know, they'll see that change in your life and they won't understand it, right? And it's not going to be easy. You will not come out of this without some scratches. Maybe a black eye or two, right? But do it anyway. Because you know what? Our world needs this love desperately. Desperately. I can't stress that enough. When you are dealing with a person who mistreats you, be in prayer for them. Ask Jesus to guide you to the best way to impact their heart. That might mean speaking up. That might mean enduring. You will need God's help, God's strength, God's wisdom, his guidance for you to know what is best here. Don't be a doormat. Don't be a doormat. Be a follower. Be a witness to the gospel, even to people who mistreat you and me. So do you have, you know, I talked about this walk, this personal relationship. Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? If you're listening tonight, do you know that he loves you? That he wants to change your life? He does. Ask him to change your heart and mind tonight if you've never done it. You can get rid of that unforgiveness inside, that ego, that pride, that hatred, that selfishness, that bitterness. All of those things can be washed away tonight. Maybe you've carried burdens, regrets, and guilt, or just a simple ache. This simple ache in your heart. Through a personal relationship with Jesus, you're never going to be alone. He offers us a new beginning, a path filled with love, with forgiveness, with peace, with comfort, with eternal life. It's a journey not of solitude, but of fellowship with the one who promises to never leave us, to never forsake us. Tonight, if your heart wants to be filled with peace, if you're tired of searching, if you're tired of searching this world for something to fulfill you, ask Jesus to come into your life. You know, if you're seeking this greater purpose than yourself, I encourage you to make a decision right now. Make a decision right now. It's the most important decision you're ever going to make. When, when we close our eyes for the last time, it'll be too late. If you don't make a decision tonight, that alone is your decision. And so you might be thinking, you might be thinking, you know, what do I need to do? What do I need to do? It's very, very simple. You might be like, Pastor Don, how I... How do I have this personal relationship? How do I how do I do this? You know, don't wait any longer. Don't wait any longer. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to clean up your life. You don't have to change things. You know, he offers each of us a message of hope. John 3:16 says, "For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus loves you and I so deeply. He took all of our mistakes, all of our failures, all of our regrets, all of our burdens, all of our wrongs, all of those wrong turns that we made, right? Those things that weigh us down, that, that, that weigh our hearts down. And in return, he handed us a gift, the fullness of his love, his grace, and his purpose. Romans chapter 10 verse 9 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You can be saved tonight. You could have a new journey begin tonight. No more waiting. You could have that confidence in knowing that when you and I die, we meet Jesus. 
We're in heaven. We're with our family and friends, right? They were also believers. It's going to be a beautiful day. And so here's what you need to do. You're like, Pastor Don, what do I got to do? First of all, you need to acknowledge your need. Begin by recognizing that, you know, we all stumble, we all fall, we all make mistakes. We've made choices that we regret. But, but the beautiful part is Jesus invites us to come with all of our imperfections, with all that baggage. His arms are wide open for us right now. And then we need to turn around. We need to make a 180 degree or 360. I don't know. We need to turn around. Repentance is what we need to do. It's about changing directions. And I always like to use the ship with the, with the sail. It's just turning away from those storms, those things that will harm you, those sins. And from that brokenness of this world, just turn away from the world and just go in a different direction. Embrace a new course. A new course towards hope. And then follow Jesus. You know, walk side by side with him, step by step. It's, it's not about religious ritual. It's not about anything like that. It's a genuine, personal relationship that only you can have with him. You don't need a mediator. You don't need a middleman. It's, it's you and the big guy. It's you and the Lord right then and there, right? Trust that he is who he claims to be, the Savior, the one who brings healing and purpose to our lives. And then finally, believe. And that means faith. Faith does not need to be complicated. And all too often, you know, religion makes this stuff so complicated. It's, it's as simple as, as just trusting that Jesus is real, that his love is authentic, and he has a purpose for you and for me. He has a plan for your life. Taking the first steps towards him is like embarking on this incredible journey filled with hope and filled with promise. Again, you're never going to be alone for this. And so you can start a new path forward with, with just this short prayer. This is how it all kicks off. Will you pray this prayer with me right now? Will you join me? Father, I want to follow Jesus. I want to turn away from my sins and place my trust in him and ask for your forgiveness right this very moment. I'm going to receive the gift of eternal life and confess you as Lord. Thank you for loving me and for dying for me. Thank you for giving me new life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer this evening, I, I ask that you reach out to me. I ask that you know you share that because you know we'll celebrate with you. Come to church on Sunday, we'll pray with you, and we'll begin this new incredible journey together. And so right now, let's go ahead and turn to the Lord in prayer. And I encourage you, we got a long list. I encourage you to add these people to your to your prayer list. Because you know, I say it every week, but when we pray, you know, things do change. Storms can, can stop. When we pray, you know, doors that were closed can open. When we pray, you know, those broken relationships can be healed, can be restored. Those people that were treating you poorly, those people that were disrespecting you can change. When you pray, sickness can be lifted and healed. When you pray, hope is rekindled. When you pray, strength renews. When you pray, you know, the answers do come in his time. Don't lose faith in what you're praying for this very moment today. God is faithful. His answers will come just at the right time. So let's go ahead and turn to the Lord right now in prayer. Will you join me? Heavenly Father, we come to you with hearts full of Gratitude, thanking you for your unwavering goodness, your faithfulness, your protection, all of the ways that you've blessed us and the countless ways you've done that. And we are so grateful for all that you do for us each day. Lord, also tonight we lift up our burdens. 
We lift up our beloved church family who are facing things like health issues or financial challenges or relationship difficulties. Lord, tonight we just ask for protection in our schools, for the children, for the teachers, for the staff. Lord, just watch them. Lord, I know that you go with them. Tonight, there was a sh or today there was a shooting during school at that Appalachian High School in Winder, Georgia. And Father, we just pray for those 30 who were injured, those four, we just ask the four who were killed, or we just lift up their families to you tonight. These children were taken too soon. And we just lift up their families, Lord. We know that you are with them, that you go with them. And Lord, you know our hearts, you know our needs, you know our brokenness. We humbly seek your healing and your help, your comfort. Lord, we ask that you be with Sonia Hale, Nail and her mom, Phyllis Nail, as they continue to face health issues. Wrap them in your love and bring them strength. Please also be with Stacy Miller Singer as she's recovering from shoulder issues. Grant her peace and patience, Lord, and healing. Lord, we lift up the Piper family, Beth, Cassidy, and Jacob. Lord, we just lift them up to you. Also, Jen Woomer Hamilton and her family and her ongoing health issues, especially her dialysis. Lord, we lift up Peach and her grandson Hazen and her brothers Rod and Woody, who are both fighting cancer this evening. May your love and healing touch be upon all of them. We ask for your healing and comfort for Scott Beck and his brother Dan Beck as they face many health issues. Please be with our my Aunt Cookie DiStefano and help her to be able to walk again. Lord, we ask that you place your hands on Darlene Blonde Smeek. Help her to stay healthy, Lord. We also lift up Sonny Schaefer, Jordan and Robin Phillips, Emily Schrock, Jamie Eckerd Desch, Diane Walls, and Alan and Jen Gallagher. Father, we also lift up Jody Colt, Carrie and Kevin Prusnak and their family. We also pray for the Snyder family, Marvin and Vicki, April and Buzz, and then Deb Stell as well. Carrie B and her kids and family. We also pray for Megan DeGaulle as she's still continuing to, uh, to recover from shoulder surgery. And also for her daughter, Mia Grace. We lift up Tyler Magaha and his family and his business. Edie Elizabeth Johnson Lowe and her family. We pray for the Rudisil family, John and Linda, and we ask for your guidance and your blessings in their lives. Lord, we also pray for Rose Murrow and her family. Joshua Jacobs and his family. Eli, Owen, Amelia, and actually his much larger family that I got to meet this past Sunday. Please work in also Megan Christophic's life and bring her closer to you, Lord. We place in your hands also Joe Stupio and his wife Peggy as she's facing many health issues, and we ask for your healing touch. We ask for blessings on the McGee family, Warren and Holly. Holly as she's dealing with her knees. Protect their family and, their, and strengthen their faith walk. We also entrust to you Victoria and Chris Wilson, as they were just newly married, Lord, we just ask for your guidance and advice and wisdom in their, in their new family life. Lord, we also lift up Brenda Muckel, Joanne Mock, and we also pray for Sheila Fenny and her family. Charles Gilliard, as he navigates life, Lord, one day at a time. We know he's missing Red, his wife, 
because she passed away, Lord, but she's still with him. Those memories are still right there. Give him strength and comfort each day. We also pray for Julie, her check, and Julie's family. Glenna and Don Rabenstein, my cousin Tina and her husband Jose and the kids. We ask for your blessing on Steve Stevens, Dean Branda, and his wife, Joe Biddle, Lord. And also, Lord, we, it's Joe Biddle's birthday, Lord. We just lift him up to you today. Chris Cross, Nathan Slippy, and the Berry family, Ralph and Christine, Tyler and Braden and Jordan. We also lift up Christine's uh, family, the Russells, as they lost Merle here a couple of weeks ago, Lord. And we lift up Ralph's mom, Sally, who's dealing with a lung nodule, and her sister Peggy, who's battling cancer. We also lift up Pastor Paul and Cindy Johnson and their family. And also protect and we pray for their, their, their kids, their grandkids, and also for Aaron Bomeisel and our Sunday Quan and the entire Bomeisel family. We pray for John and Kathy, Laura and Mary Ellen. Lord, we also ask for your blessing on Brother Anthony English and his wife, Polly, Gwen Fisher, her daughter, her family, the Stotler family, Sandy and Tom and the Harpsters, my cousin David. We pray for Tammy Lingenfelder, Danny Campbell, Butch and their family. We also submit in prayer to you, Vincent Mucle, his wife Lillian, baby Lorenzo and Castro in Oakland. Lord, we just pray for those kids. We pray for the Mucle family, his mom, and also Vince Sr., his father. We also pray for Norma Sanders and the entire DeStefano family. We pray for David and Linda. And we also pray for First Baptist Church of Seward, Pastor Rex, Pastor Rick Miller, and their families. Lifting up tonight, Paul Kolobov, as he's continuing his ministry schooling. We also pray for Lawrence and Kayla Rissler and their family, their business. And Lord, I also lift up my family, my wife, Angelina, my son, Elliot, Becca, the entire Miller family in Texas, Lord. Just pray for their upcoming wedding. Lord, we just pray for protection and peace and comfort for our entire family. We also lift up fellow pastors in our community, asking for your wisdom and strength as they lead their congregations. We pray for our community, our nation, and our world. We ask for your blessings, our guidance, your guidance for our neighbors, our families, and the college students. We place in your loving hands the missionaries who are out spreading the gospel, your light. Ask for their safety and success. And Lord, we bring before you all of the struggles that are going on, these wars in Israel and Russia and the Middle East. The innocent families being affected, all those hostages, those Jewish hostages, Lord, um, who were killed. Be with their families, Lord. Be with the Americans the American Navy folks that were just kidnapped, be with them, Lord. Grant them comfort and hope and a path forward towards peace. We also pray for our nation, asking for wisdom and righteousness in our leaders, Lord. We ask that our leaders turn to you, turn to the Bible. We also pray for protection for our military and a renewed sense of unity and purpose for all. Tonight we lift up and we pray with our hearts for our fire, our police, our EMS, asking for their safety as they serve our community. We also pray for our church family, seeking you, seeking your continued blessing for all our spiritual growth and well-being. And finally, Lord, I just want to thank you for your unfailing love, for answered prayers, for all the blessings. We trust in your grace to lighten our burdens that we carry. Fill us with your peace and strength and hope and faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Prayer is such a powerful thing. It's such a beautiful thing. It helps to calm the heart. At Altoona First Center Baptist Church, we're all about family. We're all about the Bible. And we'd love to welcome you just as you are. 
Our doors are open at 903 North 4th Street every Sunday at 1045. There's no need to worry about dressing up. Just come as you are. You don't need to get all cleaned up to come to our church. Bring a friend along. Bring a neighbor. We also would love to hear from you. If you don't live in this area, but maybe you have a question, maybe you want to share a story, maybe you want to send a letter, or maybe you want to support our our ministry, you could do that by sending a letter, care of Pastor Don at Altoona First Center Baptist Church, 903 North 4th Street, Altoona, Pennsylvania, 16601. You could also email questions to donaldmast at gmail.com. If you'd like to learn more about who we are as a church, you can visit our website, a one That's a1sbc.org, and we're all about spreading the word of God. We're all about helping those to develop their personal relationship with Jesus, supporting one another in our faith journey. Our church has been serving our community since 1911, reaching those who are lost and equipping the saved, just like Jesus told us to do in the Great Commission. So tonight, if you're a new believer, or if you're just curious, if you're just exploring you're always welcome to come visit us at 903 North 4th Street in Juniata this Sunday at 1045. And let the joy of Christ's message fill you. Thank you so much for listening. I just ask that you pray for, continue to pray for me and my family. I can, I never turn away a prayer. We, 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 we definitely need them. So I just want to thank you for listening. We love you. Have a blessed rest of the week. Take care. See ya.